A prominent soul winner once said, let the cross be raised again at the center of the marketplace, as well as on the steeple of the church. Jesus was not crucified in a cathedral between two candles, but on a cross between two thieves, on the town heap at the crossroads, so cosmopolitan that they had to write his title in Hebrew and Latin and Greek. The Son of God was crucified at the kind of place where cynics talk smut, where thieves curse, and where soldiers gamble. Because that is where Christ died, and since that's what he died about, that is where Christians can best share his message of love, because that is what real Christianity is all about. End of quote. From my conversion as a youth, I wanted to be a soul winner. With a toy printing press, I printed scripture verses on little scraps of paper and distributed them. Never did I dream that in a few years we would be publishing gospel literature in over 120 languages at the rate of more than a ton per working day to facilitate personal soul winning worldwide. In the book of Acts, there were only two methods of evangelism, mass evangelism and personal evangelism. Within a short time after the death of the apostles, theological controversy usurped the place of soul winning in the church, and apostasy resulted. By the fourth century, the Dark Ages had already begun. It was not until the 18th century that mass evangelism began to reappear under John Wesley. Personal evangelism, as the early church practiced it, has only begun to be rediscovered in this century. For generations, Christians evangelized the church, the classroom, the pews, but not the world. People were enlisted for the class or the club and invited to the church building where it was hoped they would decide for Christ. That was good for those few who would attend. But 90% of the unconverted never enter a church, so they can never be one there. That's why the Christian's greatest opportunity is outside the church building. This message encourages and teaches Christians to win souls at the factory, in the parks, on the streets, in the homes. The Christian's greatest opportunity is not winning souls inside the church building, but out in the world, out where the people are. The church was born in a blaze of personal soul winning. It was a house-to-house, face-to-face ministry. These messages that I've recorded for you on soul winning are a stimulant for pastors and lay people to rekindle the individual Christian's passion for souls. They can serve as a passport to the busy crossroads and marketplaces of humanity out where the people are. Over a hundred thousand complimentary copies of the first edition of our book entitled Soul Winning and its companion book were mailed to pastors, missionaries, national church leaders, and evangelists worldwide. Its seed concepts have helped produce a new breed of Jesus followers around the world, promoting contact between church insiders and world outsiders in homes and schools, in factories and markets, in parks and streets, out where humanity hurts most, and only Christ's love can really heal them. These inspiring ideas met with such worldwide enthusiasm that we published a natural sequel that we entitled, Join This Chariot. Today, these two books are translated into many major languages and have already become classics in evangelism literature. A fresh breeze of New Testament style of evangelism is blowing across the world today. The Christian's life motto is very simple. One way, one job. The one way is Jesus. The one job is evangelism. There is no fulfillment like being part of God's number one job, giving the good news to every creature, winning souls, out where the people are. 
Dr. Osborne is now ready to share with you message number one, the heartbeat of soul winning. A group of Christian women were holding their regular prayer meeting. The evangelist at their church, an ardent soul winner, was their guest speaker. He had overheard them talking about a disreputable woman in their neighborhood. The evangelist asked them, what are you doing to show Jesus love to that lady? The speaker spoke up, oh, we're faithfully praying for her salvation every time we meet. Fine, the evangelist remarked, but she'll go to hell if all you do is pray for her. Have you gone to her? Have you shown Jesus love to her? Have you gone to her home? The errand boy philosophy. Have we made an errand boy out of God? Have we forgotten that he is the master and we are the servants? Do we tell God to do all the things which we are encouraged as Christian believers to do? To visit the poor and needy, to comfort the feeble, to bless and provide for the destitute, to encourage those in prison, to sustain the weak, to witness to unbelievers? Do we want God to do all of these things while we just pray? Have we developed a religion of convenience? Ponder this question. Can you think of one thing which Jesus Christ can do in your town or your community without a body to operate through? You see, when God visited humankind to show himself, he came in a physical body. Jesus Christ was God in the flesh, according to John chapter 1, verse 14, and 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. They killed him, but he returned in the form of the Holy Spirit to take up his abode in our bodies as his temple. That's confirmed by 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Now, you and I are Christ's body. You are the church, the body of Christ today. You are Christ's body in your community. Christ ministers through his body today the same as he ministered through a human body some 2,000 years ago. Today, his body is the church, but the church is me, my body, and you, your body. We are his temple. I am the church. I am Christ's body. You are the church. You are Christ's body. Ephesians 5 verse 30 says, For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Christ can do nothing except through the church, which is his body. That is you and me, not our congregation, not our denomination, but the church. Christ's body is me, and it's you if you're a Christian. When we stand before God, we'll give an account of the deeds we personally have done. We'll not be judged in the light of what our church did as a spiritual body. God will not call our assembly as a unit for judgment. He'll not judge what our congregation has done as a part of the corporate body of Christ. We'll not be able to say, Lord, my pastor will speak for me. I'm a faithful member of the church body. We all work as a unit in our church, so I can't answer as an individual. Did you know, as far as God is concerned, you personally are the church. You are Christ's body. We talk about the church or body of Christ as being the mystical union of believers, the spiritual community of called out ones. That sounds very holy, doesn't it? And it's true. But like all truth, it must become personal. Otherwise, it's fruitless. Christians usually regard the body of Christ in its general or collective sense, not in its personal application. Salvation is personal. Christ must live in us personally. According to Colossians chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, it talks about the great mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to the saints, which is Christ in you. Christ must have a body to minister through. That body is me and you. We are the church, his body, his temple. I think that's terrific. 
This doesn't imply that we ignore the body of Christ in its collective or so-called corporate sense made up of all true believers. It simply means that you and I are alert to the fact that Jesus Christ is born in us and that we are now his body. It sounds more correct to say we are members of his body. And we are, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. But this historic membership concept has somehow sedated the personal aspect of Christ in you. Christians often remain devitalized in their churches, leaving the ministry to the community of believers. They say, the church the Sunday school, the ladies' society, the men's group, the youth team, they will do this, they will do that, they will go here, they will handle this ministry, they will handle that ministry. The members like to know that their church is really doing things. They're willing to pay for this as long as some other members do the work. But Christianity is a personal thing. If Christ has come to dwell in you, you are his body. That is, so far as you're concerned, and I think that's some of the greatest news in the Bible. He dwells in you because he wills to minister through you. He must have your body in order to reach your community. The essence of the Christian experience is Christ in you. When he was in Nazareth, the Bible says in Mark chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, he could there do no mighty work because of their unbelief. Without human faith on the part of the people, his ministry was limited then. And without humans as instruments to live and speak through, he's limited today. God could have sent angels. How often it's been said, God could have sent angels to preach the gospel, but he did not. He has ordained that human beings preach the gospel. If they do not, it shall not be proclaimed, and souls shall be lost. Listen, the preaching of the gospel is limited to the willingness of human persons to step forth and to open their mouths for him to speak through. This same fact applies to all phases of Christian living and witnessing. Christ cannot visit the incarcerated unless he can go in your body. He will go in you. You are the church. When you visit those in prison, Christ is visiting them through you. Otherwise, he cannot visit them. Through the tradition of prayer, have we made an errand boy out of God? Prayer is vital to the Christian. Christ taught us to pray, but he told us what to pray for. Christ prayed, but he did more than pray. In Acts 10, verse 38, it says, he went about doing good. What? Witnessing, comforting, visiting, speaking, showing compassion. In brief, demonstrating God in action. How sacred we make our traditional prayers sound. How humble and how dedicated we feel while we are at prayer, sending to God all of our orders for the day or for the week or for the month. Do we tell him to do the things which we, as Christians, are encouraged to do? Shall we just tell him to preach too? Why not? If he's so convenient for us, would he mind including some preaching now and then on our behalf? With us, but now in us. Isn't it strange? We talk about how the Spirit was with the people before the day of Pentecost. Now we rejoice that he is in us. Well, that's exactly where he is, in us. Not floating around the world, hovering over human beings here and there as they direct him, solving their problems, visiting and encouraging people while we live our quiet, personal lives in privacy. That's not the way it works. Through God's redemptive plan, Jesus Christ has now returned through the Holy Spirit to live and act through you and me. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 13 in the Living Bible, it says, For God is at work within you, 
helping you want to obey him, then helping you to do what he wants. I like that translation. This is what God did in Christ. Now he does the same in us because we are his body today. He speaks through our lips. He visits the needy and uplifts the fallen through us. He encourages the discouraged through us now. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up the wounds of the suffering through you and me. You and I are his body. We are the church, and that is good news. Now you can understand why that evangelist told the ladies' prayer group, why well, that woman will go to hell if all you do is pray for her. You see, if we fail to do more than pray, if we never visit the lost and never witness to people, they'll never hear Christ's invitation to be saved. We must pray, but then we must arise, go out, and give people the good news. The gospel in your community. Christ's ministry in your community is expressed through you. He longs to speak to people about salvation, to convince them of their sins and of the gospel, which is the work of the Holy Spirit. But he's in you and me, and he works through your lips, your body, my lips, my body. If you don't go and witness or speak the message, your community may be lost. Christ's plan is to live in you, and he cannot visit people independent of you. No more than he can stand in the public place and preach the gospel without a Christian to speak through. Do we prefer to live selfishly? To get alone and pray? Sending up a barrage of orders and errands for the wonderful Holy Spirit to move around and do for us? Are we too busy with our TV programs, our clubs, our recreational activities, or our private interests? He has no other channel. Let us remember that the Holy Spirit moves through us. We are his temple. If we are too busy to witness, Christ has no other channel through which to minister. He lives in our bodies. Non-Christians in your community will never be visited by the Lord if you do not go and speak to them in his name. Those who are sick and in prison shall never be visited by Jesus Christ if you and I do not go to them in his name. People shall never see God except as they see God through you and me. Christ's love can only be manifested through the life of a believer. His compassion and concern for lost souls can only be exhibited through us. Jesus Christ visits your community every time you do. Are you unwittingly confining him to your house? Do you ever let him speak to your neighbors? Have you ever allowed him to tell them the way of salvation and to offer them his life? Do you accuse people of living in falsehood while neglecting to let Jesus Christ tell them the truth? The church, Christ's body, is you. Have you always thought those things are the responsibility of the church? You're absolutely right. They are. However, the church is not the congregation or the denomination. The church is Christ's body, and that's what you are. That's good news, isn't it? What a privilege. What an identity. What an honor. Christ does not live in a cathedral of stone or in a temple of brick and mortar. He lives in your body. You are his temple. He ministers, exhibits himself, demonstrates his compassion, extends his mercy through your body, through you, the wonderful you that you are, the wonderful you that Christ causes you to be when he lives in you. This truth is the heartbeat, the pulse, the motivation of personal soul winning. Everything else constitutes the mere mechanics of personal witnessing. This truth comprises the essence, the spirit, the dynamics of personal witnessing. Mechanics or dynamics? You can memorize the mechanics, but the dynamics must be born in you. It must be a divine revelation, a miracle, and that's happening to you right now. That spiritual miracle is taking place in you 
as you listen so that personal soul winning will have a new life-giving dimension in and through your life from today. You have been saved to be Christ's witness, his body, his church, his voice, his heartbeat. Your body has become his temple. He ministers through you. You are lost in him. His life is the energy of your witness. You go on his behalf so that he can go through you and reach the unconverted. That is Christianity in depth. Everything else is superficial and without significance. Christ is in you. You have a purpose for living and for witnessing. A soul winner visited a Sunday school class and was asked to teach a large group. He asked them, how many of you here are Christians? Everyone raised his or her hands, and the regular teacher exalted, wonderful, isn't it? But the guest teacher countered, no, it's not wonderful, it's terrible. We should have unbelievers here and get them converted in this classroom. And he was correct, my friend. Often the church, or what we refer to as the church, is segregated from the unconverted. It's been called the sacred spot where little groups meet to minister to themselves in seclusion. Quietly learning of Christ in depth. As an evangelist tried to arouse a small congregation in Japan to be more evangelistic, the pastor said, Evangelist, you don't understand. We don't want a large crowd. We only want a small group where we can meet together in quietness to study the word of God and learn of Christ in depth. Think of that. An evangelist spoke to a men's prayer group about going out to witness for Christ from house to house, and the leader responded, Oh, we can't do that. We're not deep enough in God to do that. The evangelist said, How long have you been meeting and praying? And the fellow said, Only two years. For two years, they had kept their Lord confined to a room and had never allowed him to share his life with people in their community. What a contrast with Christians in the early church. Why, the Bible says in Acts chapter 19, verse 10, in just two years, they made the word of the Lord heard by all that dwelt in Asia. Isn't that fantastic? The reason the gospel has not been preached to every creature today is because individual Christians have misunderstood who the church really is. It's correct to speak of the church as the collective body of Christians. But friend, from a personal standpoint, the church is you. Your body is Christ's body. He can only witness and minister through you and through me. And boy, I think that's terrific. Christians have misinterpreted the Holy Spirit and his ministry through them. Could this be why the world is yet unevangelized? Might this explain why unconverted people sometimes ridicule the church and Christians? Is this a clue to why communists mock Christianity? Is this one reason why the Jews reject Christianity? Their leaders read the New Testament. They know who Jesus was, that he was a Jew. They know how he lived and how he told his followers to live. But those Jews also know how differently most Christians today live, by comparison, that is, Jesus was a soul winner. He mixed with people. He befriended the needy. He healed the sick. He spoke good news to people. He was servant to the people all of the time. Has he ever changed? Does he will to do the same things today? The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, he works in you both desiring and doing his good pleasure. But can he do these things today if you and I do not allow him to through our bodies? Without our bodies to express him through, is not Jesus Christ cut off from the people? The Director of Evangelism There was a man who had directed the evangelism department of a large church. The new pastor was a zealous soul winner. Soon after he was elected, he took the evangelism director with him in door-to-door -door witnessing. When they returned that night after leading several souls to Christ, that fellow said to the pastor, Pastor, 
I've directed the ministry of evangelism in this church for 33 years. But tonight, I have a personal knowledge of Jesus Christ that I now realize I had never experienced before in my life. Love for those who hurt. A lady who was a faithful member of a church became involved with a married man. When it was discovered, of course, she was ashamed. So she left the church, purposing never to return. The ladies society met and prayed for her. But then they did more. They delegated one of their group to go to their friend and express their love and concern for her. That was the spirit of the good shepherd at work in those women. All day long, the Christian sought for the woman, but couldn't find her. She set out again early the next day, and at noon, finally, she found her alone and depressed. She said, come back to the church. But the poor woman who was hurting inside said, I can never return. But the Christian lady said, but we want you to come back. This woman in shock said, do the women want me? And this Christian lady said, yes. They sent me to assure you that we love you. We want you. With that, the lady returned to those who loved her, and she was forgiven, reinstated, and encouraged in the name of Christ. You see, this is what happens because a Christian woman did what Jesus wanted to do. She let Jesus seek out the one that had strayed from the fold. He did it through the Christian woman. That is real Christianity. At first, you may be afraid or timid or hesitant to act in Christ's stead, but go in his name. He's in you. Yield your emotions to him. He'll guide you, and you'll discover a dimension in Christian living that you never knew before. Some ask, how can I know when God is speaking to me and leading me to do something? It's very simple. I explain it like this. Listen, and you'll hear. Look, and you'll see. Reach out, and you'll touch. You'll know God's voice. Then just act on the ideas you receive that will help and lift people, and that'll bring glory to God. What voice would tell you to go share Jesus Christ and his love with someone? To lift or help or heal or forgive someone. Would that be the voice of the devil? No, that would be the Lord's voice. Act on it and go for it. You can do it and it's exciting. The Witness at Midnight After attending church one night, a certain Christian could not go to sleep. He felt impressed to talk to a man about Christ's love for him. Finally, after midnight, he arose, dressed himself, and went to the man's house. When he knocked... The man came to the door at once. The Christian apologized. He said, it looks silly for me to be here knocking on your door at such an hour. And the poor man broke in and said, no, 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 not at all. Please come in. I've had no rest. I feel I must get right with God and I need help. You are the very man I wanted to speak to because I have confidence in your life. You see, the man was born again that night because a Christian let Jesus Christ do his ministry through him. You will grow deepest in Christ by sharing Christ with people. A lot of people want to be spiritual. The most spiritual thing you can do is reach out and speak to somebody else with a good loving message of Christ. He will become more real to you than ever before as he ministers through your body, through you. You are his church. You are his real temple. This truth therefore, is the very heartbeat of Christian living and of soul winning. Now Dr. Osborne will share his message number two, which will give you a glimpse into what things were like in the early church. It is titled, Let's Take a Journey. How would you like to visit the early church? Would their lifestyle of soul winning interest you? How do you think they went about it? Who were the preachers? How many were witnesses? What denomination was the largest or the most popular, do you suppose? What's your personal concept of the church in New Testament times? Could we follow its example? Or have times changed too much? What do you think? 
Let's take a journey in our minds back to those churches. Let's stop off at the church of Ephesus, and let's imagine a conversation we might have. Suppose we say, good evening, Aquila. We understand you're a member of the church here at Ephesus. Could we come in and visit for a while? And Aquila would say, certainly, come in. We'd say, if you don't mind, Aquila, we'd like for you to tell us about the way the church here in Asia Minor carries on their soul-winning program. We read that you've been a member of a church in Corinth and Rome, as well as this one here in Ephesus. You should be very well qualified to tell us about evangelism in the New Testament church. If you don't mind, we'd like to visit your church while we're here, Aquila. Suppose she'd say, sit down, you're already in the church, it meets here in my house. We'd say, you don't have a church building? She'd say, what's a church building? No, I guess we don't. And flabbergasted, we'd say, tell me, Aquila, what's your church doing to evangelize Ephesus? What are you doing to reach the city with the gospel? She'd say, oh, we've already evangelized Ephesus. Every person in the city clearly understands the gospel. What? What are you saying? We answer. She says, sure, is that unusual? We say, how in the world did the church do it? You certainly don't have radio or television or electronic communication. Uh, Did you have a lot of evangelistic campaigns? And Aquila says, no. As you probably heard, we tried mass meetings in this area, but most of the time we just end up in jail. We say, well, then how in the world did you do it? She says, oh, we just went to every home in the city. That's the way the church in Jerusalem first evangelized that city. The disciples there evangelized the entire city of Jerusalem in a very short time. All the other churches in Asia Minor followed their example. And dumbfounded, we say, is it effective everywhere? Yes, it is, in fact. There are so many converts that some of the pagan leaders fear that their own religions will die. Aquila goes on, she says, you know, when Paul left Ephesus for the last time, he reminded us to keep on following this same procedure. We say, Aquila, this is amazing. At this rate, there's no telling how many people are going to hear the gospel and respond. And Aquila looks back and says, oh, haven't you heard? We've already shared the gospel with every person in Asia Minor, both Jews and Greeks. We say, that's not possible. You can't mean everyone. She says, yes, everyone. We say, but that would include Damascus. And Ephesus, dozens of large cities as well as towns and villages. What about the nomadic tribes on the desert? How long did it take the churches to reach all of these people? Oh, Aquila says, not long. 24 months to be exact. We kept track of it. The same thing's happening in North Africa and Southern Europe. The gospel has reached Spain, too. We've heard of a land even called England, and several Christians may be there by now. We say, Aquila, what are you telling us? This is incredible. You've done more in one generation than we've done in a thousand years. Aquila says, that's strange. It's been rather simple for us. It's hard to realize that things have moved so slowly for you. And then she asks quizzically, maybe there's a better way to spread the good news. And I would add, Maybe there is, and maybe recording these messages will become a seed or a key for you and your life and your church. That's what I pray will be the result of it. I was only 12 years old when I was converted, but from that day, I wanted to be a soul winner. I was the seventh son of my parents. My father was the seventh son of his parents. I was raised on a farm, and we really worked hard for a living. An older brother of mine named Lonnie was converted at an old-fashioned brush arbor meeting. There was such a great change in him that even as a 12-year-old boy, I became very interested. Lonnie took me to what he called a revival meeting in an old building at Manford, Oklahoma. That night, I received Jesus Christ as my Savior, and I became his follower. Within a few months, my father moved us into the little town. He opened a feed mill and an agency to buy dairy cream on behalf of a large company, and I operated the little cream station. With a toy printing press, I printed scripture verses on scraps of paper, my first tracts, I guess you'd call them, and I distributed them among the townspeople. 
The population was only about 300 or 350. Little did I dream that in a few years we would be publishing gospel literature in more than 120 languages at the rate of more than a ton per working day. From the time I was converted, I had one simple basic desire. I wanted to be a real soul winner. Years have come and gone now. I started preaching at the age of 15. I was married at the age of 18. I became a missionary in India at the age of 21. We've preached face to face to millions of people in 70 different countries. The more my wife Daisy and I study the scriptures and the further we travel in evangelism, the more we're convinced of this fact. The greatest calling for every Christian is to lead people to Jesus Christ. In these recordings, I'm sharing with you seven reasons why we are soul winners. These messages present many new ideas for pastors, new concepts for Christians, new inspiration for evangelists, new goals for churches. These may be the most vital recordings for believers with a passion for soul that we've ever recorded. Unbelievable as it may seem, the first book written on personal soul winning was published since 1900. Can you believe it? Many Christians, pastors, and churches have not yet rediscovered the powerful ministry of witnessing out where people are, like the early church did. Two kinds of evangelism. In the book of Acts, there were only two types of evangelism practiced. One was mass evangelism, and the other personal evangelism or individual evangelism. By far, the greatest results were achieved through personal evangelism. The early church was born in a blaze of personal witnessing about Jesus Christ. Occasionally, multitudes assembled to hear one of those Christians preach or speak, especially where some outstanding miracle healing had occurred. But consistently, those early believers were busy in the marketplaces, on the streets, in the houses, persuading men and women to believe on Jesus Christ. They were personal soul winners. The first chapter of the book of Acts begins with the standard for the early Christians. It talks about what Jesus began both to do and teach when he walked on this earth. And he continued doing it and teaching it through them. He was living and ministering through them, and they realized that fact. They were his voice, his feet, his body. He was carrying on what he began, and he was doing it through them. He never changed. He was the same through them. The Bible makes some fantastic statements about their success. For example, Acts chapter 5, verse 42. Daily in the temple and in every house, they never stopped teaching and preaching Jesus Christ. Isn't that a terrific verse? The perfect 2020 vision. Those early Christians had what we would call a 2020 vision, and we support that with Acts chapter 20, verse 20. It says, I have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God, and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the whole thing in a nutshell, isn't it? Public ministry and house-to-house -house ministry to both Jews and Greeks, no prejudice, no barriers, and they were teaching repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. That's our message today. Here we see them engaged in two types of evangelism. Mass evangelism, it says they taught publicly, and personal evangelism, it says they taught from house to to house. Observe this. From Acts chapter 2 until Acts chapter 20, which spans about 30 years, door-to-door -door soul winning was their lifestyle. Tucked away in chapter 19 of the book of Acts is one of the most exciting verses I think we can find. It's Acts chapter 19 verse 10 and this is what it says. This continued for the space of two years. That's 24 months. Listen to what happened. So that everyone who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. 
I say that's terrific. Think of it. In two years, all of Asia Minor heard the gospel. And it was done without automobiles, jet planes, radio, TV, tapes, cassettes, records, films, videos, or newspapers. It was done through mass evangelism and personal evangelism, and most of it personal evangelism. Why were the first century Christians able to accomplish so much when Christians in our time, with so many fantastic advantages, accomplish, by comparison, so much less? Mainly because personal soul winning, the most effective arm of New Testament evangelism, has not been practiced in the traditional church of this century. A Brief History of Evangelism to explain why I say that, let me give you a brief review of the history of evangelism. And I think this will be interesting. During the first century after Christ, his followers possessed an unquenchable passion and an undying zeal to persuade everyone about Jesus. They remembered his promise to return as soon as the gospel was preached in all the world for a witness to all nations, like Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. Then, in the second century, Christianity became entangled in theological controversy. Rather than pressing on to the uttermost parts and to the regions beyond, they began to argue over doctrinal points. The third century found Christianity sinking into apostasy. Then the fourth century closed the gap. Their backsliding and compromise was complete. Christianity was then plunged into a thousand years of spiritual darkness that's called the Dark Ages. And boy, believe me, it was the Dark Ages. This terrible thousand years has become a veil that has obstructed the contemporary church from perceiving New Testament methods. Martin Luther first broke out of the darkness with the revelation of Romans chapter 1, verse 17, that the just shall live by faith. But the Reformation led by Martin Luther was not a return to mass and personal soul winning. It was a revolt against the religious hierarchy and an invitation for believers to examine the scriptures for themselves, something forbidden by the ruling clergy. After all, the people were not even allowed to read the scriptures. Luther said practically nothing about missions or world evangelism. In fact, it was almost 1800 A.D. before a man by the name of William Carey brought the concept of missions back to the heart of believers. That hasn't been long ago. The teachings on the baptism of the Holy Spirit were not rediscovered until the 20th century. The Long Road Back Christianity has endured a prolonged and tenacious resistance to New Testament concepts. Many have not yet returned to the foundation of the early church, the basic principle of personal soul winning, which is Christ ministering through a believer. Mass evangelism reappeared about 200 years ago under John Wesley. Men like George Whitfield introduced it in the Western Hemisphere. There have been about four peaks in mass evangelism. One under Wesley, the second under Finney, the third under Moody, and then the greatest of all since the turn of the 20th century. In the mid-1700s, a great moving of God's Spirit was manifested through what was called the Camp Meeting Epoch. Then in the 1800s, the Brush Arbor concept became popular. Then a word called revival became vogue. Then in the 20th century, the words revival and evangelism became intermingled. Later, the popular terms varied between revival and evangelistic crusade or campaign, either church-centered or city-wide. However, personal evangelism has not yet been generally rediscovered by the institutionalized church. Corey and Spurgeon wrote the first two books on personal evangelism 
early in the 20th century. Since then, hundreds and hundreds of books have been published on the subject. Unfortunately, their content usually indicates that the New Testament concept of personal soul winning has not yet been rediscovered by the popular membership of historical church organizations. Many varieties of programs, projects, plans, and crusades on enlistment evangelism have mushrooms. The main emphasis has been to get unchurched people to Sunday school, to a Bible class, or to the church meetings. Generally, little has been taught among denominations on how to actually win souls, how to lead people to a decision for Christ, how to reach them out where they are, at the factories, at the restaurants, the parks, on the streets, and in the homes of people. Too often Christians are not taught that each believer, as an individual, is Christ's body, that the Lord can only reach people through individuals, that each believer is Christ's body on earth today. Many churches have excellent programs and training classes on how to invite people to church, but not on how to get them to accept Christ out where they live and work and play. Reversing the Pattern In the New Testament, they testified from house to house and made disciples among the people. The traditional concept has been to get people to go to church first and then come to Christ. This system is fine for those who will go to church, but about 90% of unbelievers will never go to church. The New Testament concept is to get people to Christ first and then to the meeting place, to win them out where they are. Then they can come and join the body of believers. There, the possibilities are limitless. Most training programs have been based on recommending the church building. The New Testament concept was based on recommending Jesus Christ. Whether or not we like to admit it, the church as a building, as a denomination, has very little appeal to hurting people. Yet the exciting fact is that the person of Jesus Christ, when presented correctly, has the greatest single appeal to the human heart in this world. The Most Evangelized Acre. In his book entitled How to Have a Soul Winning Church, Gene Edwards says, We've attempted to evangelize the world by evangelizing the church building, every room, every pew. It's been the most evangelized acre on earth. The way we've worked at it, Gene says, you'd think the church building needed converting. We've worked as though all the lost people in the world were there. But the only problem is that the unconverted, the masses of unsaved, never have been there and never will be there. They are everywhere except where we've been trying to get them to come, inside the church building. The opportunity, therefore, is to go out where the people are and to win them there. Then they'll gladly come with us to the meeting place where the believers are. After years of waiting in the wings, personal evangelism is finally making its re-entry into church history commanding the center stage of many soul-winning organizations and evangelistic churches and even of many individual Christians. Gene Edwards, one who has strongly advocated personal soul-winning, says, There has not been a time in the last 1800 years when a great movement of personal witnessing has ripped a large portion of Christian people. He says, Open your history books. Turn back through nearly two millenniums you'll discover that the most powerful and necessary concept of Christianity has remained until recent years dead. He says, we've had a car without a motor, a plane without wings. Then he continues, he says, a revival, a rediscovery of personal evangelism is in truth a rediscovery of the spirit of New Testament Christianity. And I say amen to what Gene Edwards says. Mass evangelism reaches only those who attend the crusades. Church enlistment evangelism reaches only those who attend class or Sunday school or church. But personal evangelism 
is the only way to reach everyone. It's not centered at the crusade or inside the church buildings. It's centered outside, out where the people are. Church buildings, a very vital asset to Christianity in any generation, were not a New Testament concept at all. Again, let me quote from Gene Edwards. He says, and these words are somewhat shocking, he says, the church building concept of evangelism has been the greatest single hindrance to world evangelization. Not because we have church buildings, but because we've not gotten out of our church buildings. And then Mr. Edwards goes on to say, a church building serves one simple purpose, to keep you warm in winter, cool in the summer, and dry when it rains. This is not an appeal, he says, for you to go burn down your church building, but to see the building in its right perspective. Realize that evangelism is not to be centered inside the church building. The church is not the place to bring people into to convert them. It's a refueling station to send Christians out from. Segregated Societies just before Christ ascended, he plainly told his followers where to go and what to do in terms too clear to be confused. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. He said, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. Get your map and see what that means. Jerusalem means your hometown. All Judea represents your state or your province or your nation. But why did Jesus specify Samaria? It was part of Judea, and he'd already said, go to all Judea. I'll tell you why he specified and in Samaria. Samaria was segregated. John chapter 4, verse 9. The Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Doesn't that sound holy? Doesn't that sound religious? Doesn't that sound pious? Remember, when the Jews slandered Jesus, you remember what they said in John chapter 8, verse 48? They said, didn't we say well that this guy is from Samaria and has a devil in him? Jesus told us to reach all Judea, and Samaria was part of Judea. But then he repeated, and Samaria. In other words, he said, don't forget the forgotten ones, the hurting ones, the unloved masses, the segregated ones. Samaria, for you, can be an Indian or Aboriginal reservation, a minority community, a migrant settlement, a ghetto, a rehabilitation center, an immigrant or refugee community, or any place that's considered inferior or is segregated from the mainstream of society. Jesus listed these places, and then he added, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. In other words, he's saying, at home and abroad. Soul winning is a worldwide ministry. The two types of evangelism, mass evangelism and personal evangelism, originated with the early church. Daisy and I are simply following their example. In mass evangelism, we've already preached to millions face to face. But regardless of the masses who attend our crusades, there are always millions of others in the same country who never attend our crusades. Mass evangelism can only reach the masses who attend. It can never reach the millions who do not choose to attend. Radio and TV evangelism can only reach those fortunate enough to have a radio or a television set or access to one. It doesn't reach and cannot reach the multiplied millions who are too poor or too primitive to have access to these media. The masses can only be reached by personal evangelism. A great percentage of these can actually be won to Christ through personal witnessing. Fortunately, a hundred percent of those who are not one can at least be given a personal witness. It's the only way to reach every creature. Isn't that interesting? We are engaged in every possible concept of mass evangelism to reach the largest possible number of those who can be attracted to a public gospel meeting. 
we're involved in personal evangelism to reach those millions who will not attend the gospel crusade. We've developed and supplied stockpiles of various soul-winning tools like tracks and books and tapes and films and videos and cassettes to both induce Christians to go out after souls and then to help make their witness more effective when they do share the good news. The early church had mass meetings occasionally, but their greatest results were always affected through believers who were engaged in personal evangelism, winning people to Christ in face-to-face, house-to-house ministry. Like it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 47, and the Lord added to the church daily. Minimal church growth. Did you ever stop to think that the minimum number of converts in your church could be 365 souls per year if the Lord added to the church daily? Yet, let's face it, there are very few churches in all the world which achieve that level of growth. How did the early church do this? Well, the answer, of course, is found in Acts chapter 20, verse 20, as we said before. They taught publicly and from house to house. Now, that 2020 vision still works today, and it is working. It is happening in many great churches across the world, wherever they're implementing these ideas. Most pastors and Christians are concerned about their church. They wonder why the unconverted don't attend. They even pray for them to come. Usually, they do not go out where the people are. If they just pray, the unconverted will be lost because Christ can only reach them through the Christian's personal life and witness. Isn't it expecting an awful lot to expect non-Christians to come to the church buildings to receive Christ? Should not Christians allow Christ to visit the unconverted wherever they are, through the church of Jesus Christ, through the individual believer? Are we expecting too much when we ask Christians to go to the houses of people out where they are? We're his body, the body of Christ. Moody Bible Institute has estimated that less than 5% of Christians have ever led a soul to Christ. Only about 10% of the people in so-called Christian nations even attend church. Sometimes I'm amazed to see God getting more cooperation from non-Christians than from Christians. There are unbelievers who will come to God's house, but there's a much smaller percentage of Christians who will go share Christ in non-Christian homes. Of whom does God expect the most? He never said, Go ye unconverted to my house and be ye saved lest ye die. No. But he did say, Go ye believers to every creature. My wife Daisy and I feel that this is our greatest opportunity. It's our call, our ministry, our open door of service to people. And it's your opportunity too. If you've believed on Jesus Christ, it's your call in fact. Jesus Christ wants to witness to people and to love them through you and through me. From the gallery to the arena. Personal soul winning is the open door of success for every Christian on earth. It's the opportunity that transforms a Christian from being just a spectator into a direct instrument of the Holy Spirit. It lifts believers out of the gallery of being just hearers of the word Suddenly, like James chapter 1, verses 22 to 25 talks about, suddenly they step out into the arena of being a doer of the word. There's nothing as exciting as coming to church and looking across the aisle at a new believer that you personally led to Christ. He did it through you. You found the lost person out where the people are. You let Christ win that soul through you. No church can be ineffective when scattered throughout its congregation or members like that. This message is meant to encourage the methods of early Christianity, the soul-winning method, the house-to-house operation that inspires Christians to go out and to share Christ with people wherever they are. The church was born in a blaze of personal soul-winning. In a revival of that passion, the Church of Jesus Christ will reach her finest hour as believers write the church's last chapter before Christ's return. To that end, I've outlined 
seven reasons why we are soul winners. And I'm going to share them with you in these messages. Number one, I'm a soul winner because Jesus was. Number two, I'm a soul winner because the harvest is so great. Now, these are just ordinary ideas, but they're important basic messages. Number three, I'm a soul winner because the laborers are so few. Number four, I'm a soul winner because Jesus said to do it. Number five, I'm a soul winner because of the unfulfilled prophecies concerning Christ's return. Number six, I'm a soul winner because we don't want the blood of non-Christians on our hands. And number seven, I'm a soul winner because of what Daisy and I have experienced in our own personal lives. Now, Dr. Osborne will share with you his message number four, which he has titled, The Greatest Calling. This is a significant message to enrich your own esteem of yourself as a Jesus person and of what that actually means to you in real life. Daisy, my wife and I, are soul winners because Jesus was a soul winner. The Bible says this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. What is this all-important saying? That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. Then Luke chapter 19 verse 10 says, The Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus came to save people. That is his mission. First and last, Jesus was a soul winner. The greatest soul winner the world has ever known. The first group Jesus chose to follow him received this challenge. It's recorded in Matthew chapter 4 verse 19. Follow me and I will make you fishers of people. Then the last group who followed Jesus out to his ascension received this command. You shall be my witnesses to the world. Go make disciples of all nations. So we can say first and foremost, Jesus was a soul winner. That's why he came to save people. That's why he lived and died and rose again and sent the Holy Spirit to his followers to make them effective soul winners. The word Christian means Christ-like. Christ came to save people, to seek out the lost. So to be Christians, we're to be soul winners, to save people, to seek out the lost. Christ is born in us, or we could say Christ is reborn in us, and he wills to do the same things in and through us that he did when he walked on this earth in the body that they call Jesus Christ. Yet, there are hundreds of thousands of Christians who've never known the joy of allowing Christ to win even one soul through them. There are even preachers and Bible teachers who've never won a soul to Christ. Missionaries have confided in me that they've never won a soul to Christ during their entire term of ministry abroad. I repeat, to be a Christian means to be like Christ, and to be like Christ is to be a soul winner. Can this be the reason the church has not succeeded in giving the good news to every creature? Have the majority of Christians not yet discovered this truth? Since you are the church, since you are Christ's body in the earth, you can let him win souls through you. You can be a vital instrument in meeting the spiritual need of your generation. You can do it. Jesus took his message to the people. He went wherever the people were, in the marketplaces, on street corners, on the mountainsides, by the seashores, in the homes. He was criticized by the religious leaders for identifying with the people where they were. In Luke chapter 15, verse 2, they said, This man receives sinners and eats with them. They said that with a contemptible air in their voice. He receives sinners. He eats with sinners. Jesus Christ walked with sinners. Jesus mixed with people. He witnessed to them, convinced them, and won them. He was not a holier-than-thou type, a religious snob, aloof, and sanctimonious. He walked with people. They were his reason for being in this world. It can be that way with every Christian. To be Christ-like means to win people. His purpose is our purpose. His mission is our mission. His plan is our plan. He came to save people. We're here in this world for the same purpose. In John chapter 18, verse 37, he said, For this cause I came into the world, to bear witness of the truth. That's why we're in this world, to bear witness of the truth, which is Jesus Christ. Read John chapter 14, verse 6. 
He encouraged us in Luke chapter 14, verse 23, to go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. He never said, go ring a church bell and pray for people to come in. He said, go out and compel them, win them, then bring them in. You go out and get them that my house may be full. Every follower of his did just that. After his ascension, Jesus' followers acted just like him. They were busy witnessing in the markets, on the streets, in houses, around the public wells, talking, reasoning, witnessing. They were persuading and preaching and winning souls, compelling people to believe the gospel just like Jesus did it. In fact, they reminded everyone so much of Christ that critics, with contempt in their voices, called them Christians. Their critics did not know that Christ was actually reborn in his followers. They imitated his way of life. They taught and lived and acted like Jesus Christ. They were like him in winning souls. That's why we are soul winners, Jesus was. The Bible says in Acts chapter 5, verse 42, daily in the temple and in every house, they never stopped teaching and preaching Jesus Christ. In my New Testament, I have circled that word daily. Today, many churches are open no more than twice or three times a week, while sports and cinemas and casinos and racetracks and bars and amusement parks and discos are doing business daily. Too often the church building is only open on Sunday. But the real church is you and me. We are Christ's body. Christ can minister and witness through us every day, regardless of whether or not the church building is open. Early Christians were daily in the temple and in every house, teaching and preaching Jesus Christ. 